Okay, I thought since we all took the lab yesterday, or the lab, the exam yesterday, that I would go over the questions in the exam real quick just to make sure we have the optimal learning from the lab. And I'm assuming that this is going to render in a moment. Um, I haven't like even calculated the average score or released any scores yet because about half the class missed two or more of the last three. And I'm going to automatically grade those by hand if they miss two or more of them. And so I don't want to hand out scores to give you a heart attack. I know I was talking to a student this morning that said, yeah, you know, last test saw the original score and after the hand grade went up significantly. I don't want, you know, heartbreak. So that's why you haven't seen the score yet. My intention is to get those scores to you by Thursday and then to make sure that I have the, um, the lab final and the two submissions at Scrapbook that are ungraded, get those graded if I can by Friday. So over the weekend, you have a very full picture of how you're doing in the class. So looking at the questions from the test, the first one here, what two properties are required for an ideal gas? Most people, there is, I don't think there were any students who missed both of them. And most people got both of them. The molecules don't interact ideally unless they collide, in which case they have an elastic collision and they have no volume. We use high temperature, that is high compared to the boiling temperature to approximate ideal behavior for the collisions because in that case, the average kinetic energy is much bigger than the kinetic energy lost in a collision. The second one for volume, if they're far enough apart, then we can say that the size is so small compared to the separation that they're essentially going to behave like they have no volume. The second one, for monatomic ideal gas, temperature is linearly proportional to the... Now, it is related to the speed, but it's not linearly proportional to the average speed. The temperature, what we learn, is proportional to the squared RMS speed. Squared RMS speed means the average of the squared speeds. So that's why D was not the correct answer. Average kinetic energy was correct. That one has, you know, had the potential of being confusing because there is a relationship between the average speed and the temperature. But it's proportional, linearly proportional to average kinetic energy. Next one, most materials expand when you heat them. That one was pretty straightforward. What is heat? Some of these questions are really simple questions, right? But it's an important thing to know what heat is. The transfer of thermal energy without any work being done. Next one here, what method of heating occurs when you're outside at night and you feel a warm breeze? There are three forms of heating, which the three forms are all here plus two ridiculous ones. So what are the three forms of heating? Conduction, convection, radiation, radiation. not abduction, not reduction. <laughs> so conduction, direct contact. The breeze isn't a direct contact. Convection is an intermediary intermediary fluid bringing the heat. Well, the breeze is exactly that intermediary fluid bringing the heat. Radiation is electromagnetic waves. I did it at night to minimize any radiation effect because you can say, oh, you know, get a lot of heating from the sun's radiation and too. So that's why I had it at night. Actually, did I say at night? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking at the wrong <laughs> looking at the wrong problem here. Yeah, I was looking at number seven. I'm like, wait, I don't see night. What happens to the temperature of water when heat flows out of it? When heat flows out, the internal energy drops, which means the average kinetic energy drops, which means the temperature drops. Everything pretty straightforward so far? How many degrees of freedom does a monatomic ideal gas have? If you knew that F was degrees of freedom, oh, come on. I can't believe, anyway. If you knew that F was degrees of freedom, you could just look here and see F for an ideal monatomic gas is three. It was given on the equation sheet. But you would have to know that F is the degrees of freedom. And more importantly, what is a degree of freedom? It's uh, the direction in which you can move. So, 
Like a plane in which you can move. It actually has a different definition, but for monatomic, it turns out to be that. It's a way that it can have energy. And the way you can have energy now seems really weird because we say three ways to have kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is just one half mv squared. It's a scalar. But we say you have this component, this component, this component. And so one half mvx squared plus one half mvy squared plus one half mvz squared. Use the Pythagorean theorem. That is one half mv total squared. Um, but it's those three different directions is the way we it's the way it works out with physics. So your, your understanding of it for the monatomic ideal gas was correct. But when you go to the diatomic, then you have the vibrational energy and the rotational energy, which is different. So that's why I have to specify. Okay. Next question. What is the purpose of a heat engine? I hope that this one went well. I, I looked at the percentages on each question, but I don't remember them. So I can't tell you, you know, if this went well, but this is one of those important ones. You know, what, there's no point in talking about a heat engine if you don't know what the purpose is. You know, we're not here to collect facts. We're here to understand how things work. And the heat engine, the purpose is to convert thermal energy, energy that's contained by the microscopic motions and whatnot of a material, and to convert that into useful energy, mechanical energy, or work. So to convert thermal energy into mechanical energy. This matching one, you see, I did this with an earlier version of the test. There was a numbering issue on the, uh, the options over here. So I crossed them out and changed them to match what you had on your test. So match each property to its, uh-oh, did it say rotational equivalent? I'm afraid it did. I don't think I changed that. Yeah, I didn't even notice that to it well match each property let's just do that right now i'm totally embarrassed so this is asking about the four laws of thermodynamics the zero first second and third so i have fourth there because there are four laws but it starts at zero and ends in three so the zeroth law is the one that nobody thinks you ever have to state if temperature A is equal to temperature B and temperature B is equal to temperature C, then temperature A is temperature C. I know I probably should have written this out as if object A is in thermal equilibrium with object B and object B is in thermal equilibrium with object C, then object A is in thermal equilibrium with object C. The problem is that would have taken multiple lines. So I wrote it in the simplified math form of what that means. So this here is the zeroth law. The first law, what is the first law? Energy can be created or destroyed. So that was the first law. Heat naturally flows from hot to cold is, the sec is one statement of the second law. Another statement could be that any thermodynamic process has as a net result an increase in the entropy of the universe. Another statement could have been it is impossible to make a heat engine that converts heat into work without any waste. There's lots of statements of that second law. Another one that is, well, this isn't an actual statement. The second law is used sometimes as what we call time's arrow. It's actually the only law in physics that tells us the direction that a reaction should go. And it's, it's pretty simple, really. We have this innate sense that if I have these things stacked up, they're naturally not going to stack up on their own, but they will fall down if something hits them. But that's really a, a statement of the second law. Another statement of the second law that would make no sense is if I take this mass and set it on the desk, this mass has a temperature that's well above zero. So there's a lot of energy stored in this mass. The only law in physics that says that this mass is not going to suddenly convert all of that thermal energy into kinetic energy and go flying off the table. The only thing that says it won't do that is the second law of thermodynamics. Otherwise, you know, it's completely allowed. So times arrow is the term for that, again, the second law. And finally, the third law, no object can reach absolute zero. Now we get to actually doing problems. So what is the RMS speed of nitrogen molecule? I gave you the molecular mass how many grams per mole? 
I know some people made the mistake. I, I tried to remind you, but I was too late probably. You need to make sure you're careful with the units. The unit for R was in joules per mole Kelvin. A joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So that mass needed to be in kilograms per mole so that you can cancel out the kilograms in the R constant. And so, and the temperature, of course, had to be in Kelvin. So if you can mass to 0 0.028013 kilograms per mole and the temperature 293.15 kelvins, you put them in that equation and you get 500 and, well, I had, I said room temperature, which is 20 degrees Celsius exactly. So I had five significant digits in my, um, my molar mass. Hence, I put five significant digits in the answer there. Going to the, nice. Going to the next one, just using the ideal gas law. You have the number of moles. You have the temperature. You have the pressure. Once again, you have to realize, oh, I need to shift that temperature into kelvins because it's not a change in temperature. And you just put into the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, so V is NRT over P. Boom, you get the volume. This one here, number 16, did that look familiar? From the worksheet, I just made it only one rod between the two instead of two rods between the two. I changed it to copper instead of what I have iron and aluminum in the worksheet. But otherwise, it was the same question. So you have conduction in this case. You have to identify conduction is the way that heat is going to travel through that pipe. And so for conduction, the power or the heat per unit time is thermal conductivity times the cross-sectional area. I had some people ask me, what's the area of a cylinder? Well, it's the cross-sectional area, so it's the area of a circle because the cross-section of the cylinder is a circle. Divided by the length and then multiplied by the temperature difference. And in this case, because it's a temperature difference, you don't have to shift to Kelvin. If you shifted to Kelvin, you'd get the answer right. There's no danger. It's just you don't have to because the change in Kelvin is the same as the change in Celsius. All right. The last two from the applications. You start an experiment at five moles of, of a monatomic ideal gas. I stuck everything monatomic to keep life simple on you. Um, at standard temperature and pressure, standard temperature, I've seen some places say standard temperature is different, but for physicists, standard temperature is zero Celsius. I've seen some places, I think our textbook says that room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. All of my life as a physicist, room temperature has been 20 degrees Celsius, which is a far more comfortable temperature in my opinion. 20 degrees Celsius is roughly 68 Fahrenheit. It's a good temperature. 25 is warmer than I want to be. Anyway. So we're here at standard temperature and pressure, and it's then allowed to expand at constant pressure until it triples the volume. What do we call a constant pressure expansion? Isobaric. isobaric. So I could look at my equation sheet for isobaric, although you probably know this one because it's the simple one. Work is P delta V if it's constant pressure. But we have to know how much the change in volume is. And to know the change in volume, I know it's going to change two times the initial volume because it triples in volume, goes from one volume to three volume. But I have to use the ideal gas law to calculate that initial volume. So just like we did a problem or two before, you have to calculate the initial volume and then multiply that by, by two because the change in volume is twice that, and then the pressure. So work is P delta V. I calculated the, this first. In my calculations, this was the first calculation I did. This was the second thing I did down here to calculate delta V. And then I ran out of space, and so that's why my third calculation is at the top. So work is P delta V if it's constant pressure. If there's anything you have a question on, please stop me. I'm just kind of rolling through this because I don't want to spend the entire class period on the test. The last of the applications was a heat engine runs between a hot reservoir at 100 degrees Celsius and a cold reservoir at zero degrees Celsius. In other words, we're basically going from boiling water to ice water. 
for our <clears throat> heat engine. What's the best possible efficiency that the heat engine can achieve? What situation gives you the best possible efficiency? We have a special name for it. The Carnot. Saudi Carnot came up with this Carnot cycle with the, um, the constant temperature, then constant or then no heat, then constant temperature, no heat again, isothermal, adiabatic, isothermal, adiabatic. And in that case, the heat is proportional to the temperature. And so I took my efficiency equation. The efficiency is what we want out, the work, divided by what we put in, the heat at high temperature. And I replaced work with QH minus QC. So I got in the end, efficiency is one minus QC over QH. And then from the boxed equation, I saw that QC over QH is TC over TH. And I put in those temperatures and I got 0 0.27 for my efficiency, which means 27% efficient. This would not be a great efficiency engine. But if you have a source of ice and a source of boiling water, like let's say you live in, in Iceland, where you have lots of thermal vents that are producing very hot, you know, boiling water type situations, and you have lots of ice, if you have plenty of those two things, this might be a good engine to use because you don't need high efficiency if you have enormous amounts of the resource. Now to synthesis. Ethanol at room temperature has a density of 0.789 grams per centimeter cubed. Given that the coefficient of volumetric expansion is 0 0.00109 per degree Celsius, what's the density of ethanol at standard temperature? So we're going to go from 20 degrees to 0 degrees. Temperature is going to, wait, 20 degrees to 0 degrees? My picture had it expanding. Obviously, if you're going from 20 to zero, as per the earlier question in knowledge, it should be contracting then. So my picture actually, whoops, my picture's down below. <laughs> See, my picture has it expanding. It's changing volume, but I should have had those arrows inward and made a smaller cube. My bad. I didn't even think about that when I did the solution. So if you have the same mass, but you have a different volume, you're going to have a different density. So I went through with the equations here. My equations are the equation for density and the equation for change in volume for thermal expansion. And since the new density is going to be the mass divided by the new volume, I calculate what the new volume is going to be, the initial volume plus the change in volume. Well, change in volume is initial volume beta delta T. So combine those, the new volume is the original volume times 1 plus beta delta T. Putting that into my equation for the new density, mass over new volume is mass over original volume, 1 plus beta delta T, which is the original density over 1 plus beta delta T. Now that I've done all the work, I just put in the numbers. So I have the original density on top, 1 plus 0 0.00109 per degree Celsius times final temperature of zero minus initial temperature of 20 degrees Celsius gives me 0 0.807 grams per centimeter cubed. Next problem. An ice cube has a mass of 25.0 grams and temperature of minus 5 degrees Celsius when it's taken out of the, refrigerator, out of the freezer. It's placed in a sealed container so no molecules can enter or leave until it reaches room temperature. I put that in the sealed container so you didn't have to worry about any evaporation or anything like that. Um, how much heat was added or removed from the ice cube in this process? Was he, is he added or removed to melt ice? It's added. I just put add or remove to make sure, you know, people are thinking this through. And then I gave you some numbers. And I gave you more numbers than you needed. I gave the specific heats of water, ice, water, and steam. Well, you're never going to have steam in this problem. Likewise, I gave you the latent heat of fusion, the latent heat of vaporization. Fusion is going between ice and water. You're going to need that. Vaporization is going between water and steam. You're not going to need that. So those numbers, while correct, are unnecessary. So then I told you for your figure, show a graph of temperature versus heat. So it's very specific, no question. What do I need to show there? 
So here's a graph of temperature versus heat. As I put in heat, the ice is going to warm up, but then when it reaches zero degrees, it changes phase at constant temperature. So I have a flat line. And then once it's all melted, now I'm heating water and it goes up again. So I need to calculate what those three heats are. So my equations are the heat when it's changing temperature and the heat when it's changing phase. And so I calculated the three heats, one for heating ice to zero degrees Celsius, one for melting ice, one for heating water from zero to 20. So I get those three heats, this, this, and this, add them all together, and I get 10,700 joules. Um, something I should point out at this point, you have fire. Okay, we have some IRR majors here, right? Any of you actually thinking about becoming a firefighter, possibly? Well, I was a volunteer firefighter. <laughs> and so being on the fire department, we have to learn fire theory things. You know, like the triangle of fire. Anybody know the triangle of fire? I at least see a few nods. The triangle of fire is fuel, oxidizer, oxidizer, and heat. You need those three things for fire to occur. And so when you're trying to put out a fire, you're trying to take out one of those three options. So if you are in the kitchen, the oil in your little saute pan catches fire, what did you put the fire out? You do what Mira said. You put a lid over it. Because you put a lid over it, what are you doing? You're removing the oxidizer. You're making so it doesn't have a supply of oxygen to oxidize the reaction, and the reaction stops. But if your house is on fire, you don't have the option of putting a lid on. So the firefighters come out, and what do they put on the fire? Water. Why do they put water on the fire? Yeah, to get rid of the heat. It's not to smother. I always thought that it was to smother until I became a firefighter. What kind of an idiot was I? I don't know. I was a physicist and an idiot. They're putting it on there because if you look at that amount of heat required to convert water into steam, that's really big. The specific heat of water is big on its own. That 4.186 joules per gram degree Celsius is a big number compared to most things. That's actually important for weather. I'm from California. Temperatures on the coast of California are pretty mild year round. The reason is simple, because we have this big ocean. And because we have that big ocean, we have lots of water, and you can put a lot of heat into the water and the temperature just barely changes. Take a lot of heat out of the water and the temperature just barely changes. And so that water serves as what we call a heat reservoir to keep the temperatures fairly constant. Out here in the Midwest, we got nothing. We have Holmes Lake. When I came here, I didn't know that it should be called a lake. I was talking to a colleague, and I didn't know how to describe it. I live over by Holmes, and I was kind of like, pond? He was very stern and said, around these parts, we call that a lake. You know, it's not enough water to make a significant difference for the weather. And so our temperatures will fluctuate much more dramatically because we don't have that big object, of, you know, water object next to us. But then if you want to change the water into steam, that takes an enormous amount of energy. And so you throw the water on the fire, and a lot of heat goes from the fire into the water to make it into steam, that it really cools the fire to take away that leg of the triangle. Obviously, if, you'll, if you're out camping, you want to put out the fire, you might just drag the logs out of the fire individually and you know get the fuel out of there and the fire stops. Of course, each log would then still burn, but you know what I mean. Okay. Next problem. I hope you find these practical applications of physics useful. 10 moles of monatomic ideal gas start at 100 degrees Celsius and 2.00 times 10 to the fifth pascals. It expands adiabatically to twice its initial volume and then contracts isobarically to its initial volume. What was the total change in entropy for the gas? Now, I had a student come up and ask me, 
is it possible for entropy to decrease for a piece of a system yes for the entire universe no so here we're just looking at the gas yes it can be negative if heat is leaving the entropy is going to decrease if you freeze water into ice, the entropy of that water decreased as it froze into ice because you took energy out, took heat out. So yes, it's possible for the entropy to decrease. And in fact, the answer here should be negative. It's the negative 143 joules. So how do I do this? Well, the first thing is I'm going to draw my figure. Draw my figure with the two things going on. We have an adiabatic expansion and then an isobaric contraction. So my figure, come to me, has the adiabatic expansion and the isobaric contraction. My concept over here, during the adiabatic process, what can you tell me about the entropy? It does not change. So there's no change in entropy for the adiabatic process. I don't need to worry about calculating there because I know it's zero. But I do need to determine what the state is at the intermediary. So I have to use the ideal gas law to calculate. Um, I didn't give you all of the variables. I gave you the number of moles in and the temperature and the pressure, but not the volume. So you need to use the ideal gas law to find the initial volume. And then for an adiabatic process, you have PV to the gamma is constant. And so you can use that to calculate what the pressure is going to be at its new volume. And once you know the pressure at its new volume, then you know PV and N, and you use the ideal gas log to calculate temperature. And then finally, for the constant pressure contraction, the isobaric contraction, you know the volume, you know the pressure, use the ideal gas law to find the final temperature, and then the equation for the change in entropy for an isobaric process. So I have, you know, a boatload of calculations here to calculate those pieces. And I did have to use CP because CP was in that equation. CP is the molar specific heat at constant pressure. And I get my change in entropy. Now, there would be another way of doing this last, the change in entropy calculation. What would the other way of doing, of doing it be? It's not the correct. It's approximate method. Yeah. Q over just the average temperature. The temperature is changing, so Q over T can't be the correct way because it's changing temperature. But if I just use the average temperature, I'll get a number very close to this. So you could have done it with the average temperature and said, oh, I got minus 143. Well, you know, it's probably minus 144 then. I, I don't know if it was that close because I didn't do it that way. But that would be another way to do it. And I would not mark you wrong for doing it that way. The final one there for calculus, there were four different options of what to do. So I'm not going to go over all four. And then the extra credit. You have three standard six-sided dice, one red, one white, and one blue. I wrote black in my pictures because I couldn't make white. I mean, you wouldn't have seen them, right? Um, you roll the three dice and come up with a roll of six. Find the entropy of this roll. This requires us to use the numerical calculation of entropy. That entropy is Boltzmann constant times the natural log of the number of microstates in the macrostate. So here in my diagram, I wrote out each of the microstates that will give me a roll of six. One, one, and four. One, two, and three. One, three, and two. One, four, and one. That's my first set. Then I go to two. Two, one, and three, is it? Yeah. Two, one, and three. Two, two, and two. Two, three, and one. And then finally, three, one, and two. Three, two, and one. And four, one, and one. That was a total of 10 microstates. So the entropy is Boltzmann's constant times natural log of 10. And so putting the numbers, I get 3.18 times 10 minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Sarah? For that extra credit, did we have to do a concept? Um, 
I don't want to see just a number. If we have our board copy, do we have another option? Yeah, I, yeah, that's still okay. Yeah, if you just have 3.1 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin and nothing else, no, that's not going to be sufficient. Okay, any questions about the test? I know I've taken up three quarters of, well, two thirds of the lab of the class period. Any questions? Maddox. Overall, Overall, I was happier. I haven't finished, you know, I haven't done the hand grading. So I can make an actual decision and then if I'm happy or not after I've done that. Um, the high score was, um, well, the high score was 85 without, the, or 85? Yeah, I think 85 without one problem being graded because the people in 252 didn't have that. So that could be 98%. Um, or, you know, they could have done it completely wrong and it could be 86. I have to go through and see what the high score is and what the average score is before I can really determine. But it was better. Now, the low score was very disastrously low. Um, so I'm not happy about that. I think the average is significantly higher than last time. I think. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, if we got, like, Partial of that credit, or is it like an all or nothing for that? No, I'll give you partial money. Any questions? Okay, let's talk about the topic of the day. What do you say? You want to start the lecture? So, Physics 151 lectures. <clears throat> so, we started with waves before. Okay, I hit something wrong before Thanksgiving break, and we're going to, or so we started with oscillations before Thanksgiving break. Today, we're going to move on to waves. So just to, to get the difference in an oscillation in a wave, if I have an automobile and I want to check to see if it has good shock absorbers, I come up to the corner and I push down the car and let go, and it oscillates. Now, shock absorbers are dampers. We'll learn a little about damped oscillation here in the next week. I actually want to try to get to music pretty quick because I love doing the music part. But it should oscillate and slow down because that's what shock absorber does. It takes away the energy. Well, the oscillation is stationary it, as far as the oscillation is going up and down but not moving. It's an oscillation. If the car is driving down the road, then the oscillation is traveling and we would be more likely to call that a wave. So waves are traveling oscillations. So when we talk about waves, that's where we're going. Now, <laughs> this is showing a mass moving up and down stationary, so it's not a wave, it's an oscillation. Not just because I'm lazy. I left this out here because I knew I was going to use it again. So if I pull this down, it oscillates up and down. Now here's an interesting question for you. Well, let's start with some definitions. I was going to say the word frequency. What does frequency mean? It means how many times something will happen over a given time frame. Right. How many times it repeats over a given time frame. The standard unit is the cycle per second or the hertz. How is the frequency going to change with a big amplitude versus a small amplitude? Okay, James says it doesn't change. I thought I heard somebody say it gets smaller. It would seem logical to my brain that with the larger amplitude, you have more motion and it probably would have a slower frequency with big amplitude. But, but what James said is exactly correct. My logic kind of fails. When you have a bigger amplitude, it does not change the frequency. It stays the same. And so start thinking about why would it stay the same if I pull this down farther, what's happening to the restoring force? The force is trying to pull it back to equilibrium. It what? It increases, which means that the acceleration, the accel acceleration goes up. So if I pull it down farther, it's going to come up faster. And so even though it has a larger distance to travel, it's compensating going faster. And it turns out that if you do the calculus on this, 
you find that indeed it's going to have exactly the same frequency regardless of how much I stretch it. The amplitude is the term for the maximum displacement from equilibrium. Equilibrium is the position where it will be in equilibrium with no acceleration. So there's the equilibrium position. Amplitude is the farthest distance away from that. So I pull it down. It's going to go at all positions between where it is now and where equilibrium is. But the maximum distance away from equilibrium is called the, the amplitude. Displacement is at any instant the distance it is from equilibrium. So those, it's important to know the difference in those two words, displacement versus amplitude. I'm sorry, I can't make this go up and down uniformly because apparently I'm failing. So how can we calculate this frequency? If you know calculus, it's really not hard. Guess what we're going to do on Tuesday, guys? But it turns out that the frequency, first of all, frequency is 1 over period. Period is the time that it takes for an oscillation. That's simple. Period, time for an oscillation, frequency, number of oscillations per time. Makes sense. They're inverse. Then we have this thing, omega. What did we call omega in the past? Angular velocity. Angular velocity. It was on exam three, right? Now, when we talk about oscillations and waves, we call it the angular frequency. And now that's annoying. It really is. Angular frequency is the same thing as angular velocity? Well, it's the same symbol, and it has the same units. What are the units for angular velocity? Radians per second. That's the same units that we're going to have for the angular frequency. It's going to be radians per second. Not cycles per second, but radians per second. So we have a conversion factor between frequency, cycles per second, and angular frequency, radians per second. And that is there are two pi radians in one circle. So one cycle has two pi radians. So the angular velocity, or excuse me, angular frequency, see how I messed that up? Angular frequency is two pi times the frequency. Now, if you get down to it, it's really, really annoying because the units of cycle is unitless. The units of radians is unitless. So they will disappear at random, but we have to say cycles per second or hertz or radians per second so we know which one we're talking about. Okay, but then the based on physical parameters, the angular frequency is the square root of k over m. Now we have to go back to a week ago Friday where we said for any simple harmonic oscillator, we need the net force acting on the oscillator is equal to minus kx. Minus because we need the force to be in the opposite direction from the displacement. And then kx, it needs to be linearly changing with how much you've displaced it from equilibrium. And so K is whatever that linear constant is. And omega is square root of K over M. So we can calculate this for any situation. So for instance, in this case here, if I wanted to find what the angular frequency is going to be, I need to first measure, okay, here's my spring. Take a meter stick, which I'm not going to go grab. Measure how much it stretches when I put this load on it. What do you say? About, I don't know, six centimeters. And so I can calculate K because I know that I put 100 grams on. 100 grams is 0.98 newtons. So I put a force of 0.98 newtons and stretched about six centimeters. So K must be um, basically, well, 0.98 newtons per six centimeters. So I can calculate K just by making that one simple measurement. You, you'd want to make more in a real life situation. Then I have, this is a mass of 100 grams or 0.1 kilograms. And so I can calculate what's angular frequency. Let's, let's see how good my estimation comes up with. I would have had K is equal to 0 0.98 newtons over 0 0.06 meters. That was the numbers I had. And so, Uh, 
that's a 0 0.06, divide by the mass of 0 0.100 kilograms. And I would get the square root of, I'm just going to do it. Square root of 163, which is 12.8. Wrong place. Twelve point eight radians per second. Now, I usually measure things in frequency, not in radians per second. So, how do I go from twelve point eight radians per second into a frequency in hertz? How do I calculate that? Divided by 2 pi. If you look at the equations right here, omega is 2 pi f, so f must be omega divided by 2 pi. And so I take that and divide it by... And I get 2 hertz. And I, I dropped it down to just two significant figures because I estimated 6 centimeters. So now we can actually measure the frequency and see how well my estimate matches up. So who has a stopwatch handy? Okay, Mary, you good? What I'm going to have her do is measure the time for 10 oscillations. Then we'll take that and divide it by 10 to get the time for one oscillation. What do we call the time for one oscillation? The period. So we'll get the period, and then from the period, we'll take one over the period to get the frequency. So you ready? So I'll tell you when to start and stop. Start. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Stop. So the period is equal to zero point. You said seven zero. Yeah, I got seven point nine six. Oh, okay, seven nine six. So zero point seven nine six seconds. I took the number she got and divided by ten to get the period. So that's the frequency is one over zero point seven nine six seconds equals one divided by. 0.796 is obviously not 2. It's 1.26. And so now you say, well, Richard's estimate of 6 centimeters was probably off. But that's how you can measure the frequency and how you can calculate the frequency. Go up. What are the units of angular frequency? Let's just look at what each one of these are the units of. What's meters per second the unit of? Speed. What does HZ even stand for? Hertz. And what is a Hertz the unit of? Of what? All I'm hearing is Hertz. I'm sure that's not what you're saying. Frequency. Yeah, I need to go get my ears checked again. One over seconds, what's that a unit of? Frequency. These two are the same thing because a hertz is one per second. Rads per second. Angular velocity is correct, but I'm going to write what it is for oscillations, angular frequency. Angular velocity is not an incorrect answer. Just make sure it's real clear. <laughs> and unitless, hmm. Radians are unitless, actually, but I'm just going to leave that. There's lots of things that can be considered unitless. All right. Energy in a simple harmonic oscillator. Simple harmonic oscillators are transferring energy from one thing to another. Remember when I had 
the bowling ball pendulum, which I'm probably going to bring out on Friday, just for continued work. When I started with the pendulum up here, what kind of energy did it have? That potential energy. And then as it went down, what was happening to energy? It was going into kinetic, came up. What was energy doing? Going back to potential. So an oscillator, that pendulum was oscillating. It keeps oscillating because it's just moving energy back and forth between the different types. And so when I have this spring, it's the same thing. When it's down here, what kind of energy does it have? Now, this does have gravitational involved. You can't pretend it doesn't. But if I took this and I had a frictionless horizontal surface, it would do the same thing and then gravity would not affect it. So for the purposes of my explanation, I'm ignoring gravity, even though it does exist and does affect things. So if you ignore gravity, what kind of energy does it have down here? It has spring potential energy, one half kx squared. Then if I let go, what's going to happen to that energy? Transfers to kinetic until it gets to the equilibrium position when it's going to have all kinetic and no spring potential. <laughs> Keeps going up and it's going to transfer energy back into spring potential because now it's compressing the spring. You notice the pictures here have it on the horizontal plane so you don't have to worry about the gravity effect. So the gravity is working here. I wasn't perfectly honest there because there's also changes in gravitational potential energy that would go up and down. But we can actually subtract that out when we do our math. And we're not going to do that here. So it's transferring energy back and – yes? On, on the pictures here on the screen? Or on the, like, with gravity. In here? Yeah. No, it, it doesn't affect it. What What's happening is, if you look at the net force, you have, at the equilibrium position, you have gravity down and the spring pulling up, right? And so what we do is we take the gravity, um, the gravity force is constant as it moves up and down. And we essentially are taking the spring and changing the equilibrium length of the spring for the offset caused by gravity. And then it behaves the same as if it was horizontal. So it, what it really does is just changes the equilibrium length. But, I mean, it gets confusing when you start looking at the, at the equations and the energy in each one. Because, obviously, gravitational potential energy is smaller here and higher here. And so you're like, the energy is changing in gravity as well. And it is. It's true. Okay, so in this case here, just like with the pendulum, you have at its maximum displacement, you have all of the energy is equal to one-half K times the maximum displacement, which in this picture it uses capital X. Usually we use A for amplitude. Energy in a spring I should have put PE there. Potential energy for a spring is equal to one-half kx squared. So the maximum potential energy is one-half k times the amplitude squared. Now, if you come to the equilibrium position, potential energy is zero. Well, what was the kinetic energy when it's at its maximum displacement? What's the velocity of maximum displacement for our starters? At the point where it stops going down, starts going up, what's the velocity? Momentarily, zero. So the kinetic energy at that point was zero. At this point, kinetic energy is one-half m, and it's going to be v max at this point squared. So now, if total energy is not changing, the sum of these two would better equal the sum of these two, and I can get a relationship between the amplitude and the maximum speed. I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop by saying I can get that relationship in next class period. We'll do a lot with wave stuff. And then our final week, we'll talk about music. Can you believe next week is the final week?